in this video, I'm unpacking the issue of justification by faith in the apostolic fathers. Those are the earliest Christian writings we have outside the New Testament. If you haven't already seen the introductory videos I did on Reformed Protestant theology and the Apostolic Fathers, click this link to view it now. It's a great help for those who may have been told the Fathers are all Catholic, which I do not believe to be the case. Nonetheless, if you are a Protestant, you're very familiar with the slogan of the Reformation that God's people are justified by faith alone. But is this what the Bible teaches? And if so, can we see this doctrine in the apostles' earliest followers? I believe the answer to both of those questions is yes. Yeah. Just to get things rolling, here's a great definition of the doctrine and its development in the life of the reformer Martin Luther in the words of the late, great. RC Sproul. But before I get started, would you mind clicking those like, share, and subscribe buttons? I would greatly appreciate it. You can also leave me a comment. I do take your thoughts into consideration in future videos, and I may even respond. This kind of content takes me time to make, and that feedback helps videos like this get out to more people. Now let's get to Sproul. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith. Luther was stopped short. He said, what does this mean? What does it mean that the righteous shall live by faith? And so the lights came on for Luther, and he began to understand that what Paul was speaking of here was a righteousness that God in His grace was making available to those who would receive it passively not those who would achieve it actively. Now, there was a linguistic trick that was going on here too, and it was this, that the Latin word for justification that was used at this time in church history, I mean, it's the word from which we get the English word justification, the Latin word justificare, and it came from the Roman judicial system. And the term justificare it's made up of the word justus, which is justice or righteousness, and the verb, the infinitive, facare, which means to make. And so the Latin fathers understood the doctrine of justification is what happens when God, through the sacraments of the church and elsewhere, make unrighteous people righteous. But Luther was looking now at the Greek word that was in the New Testament, not the Latin word, the word dikaios, dikaiosune, which didn't mean to make righteous, but rather to regard as righteous, to count as righteous, to declare as righteous. And this was the moment of awakening for Luther. He said, you mean here Paul is not talking about the righteousness by which God himself is righteous, but a righteousness that God gives freely by His grace to people who don't have righteousness of their own. He was confirmed in this understanding by reading an essay from Augustine on the letter in the Spirit in which Augustine made that very comment that in Romans, Paul was not talking about God's righteousness, but rather a righteousness that was made available to believers by faith. And so Luther said, whoa, you mean the righteousness by which I will be saved is not mine? It's what he called a justitia alienum, an alien righteousness, a righteousness that belongs properly to somebody else. It's a righteousness that is extra nos, outside of us, namely the righteousness of Christ. And Luther said, when I discovered that, he said, I was born again of the Holy Ghost. And the doors of paradise swung open, and I walked through. Now, why is this issue so important? Well, it's important because this has everything to do with our relationship with God, how we know that we know Him, and how we know if we're going to heaven. This is an important issue because whatever our justification is, it is the process that righteousizes us, literally, and makes God okay with our existence. Kind of a big deal. So in case you didn't catch it in Sproul's explanation, justification by faith alone says that a person is made right with God by faith. That's it. Faith alone. I mean... 
pretty good deal, right? Especially if you're a sinner. It's also not hard to see how this idea might go against common logic that good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. Basically, the idea goes like this. Believe in God and you enter into a relationship with God along with the guarantee of an eternity with him when you die. Of course, much of this depends on your definition of key terms like faith and justification. Since there's clearly a difference in the way these terms were used or even what they meant to the apostles and church fathers, but I'll cover that in a little bit. Nonetheless, it's not too hard to see how this might be controversial. I mean, the faith alone thing. It doesn't sound fair, except when you realize that we all deserve death and cannot gain whatever this righteousization thing is by being good. Make sense so far? But I think that's why we call it the gospel, meaning the good news. For a young Pastor AJ, Now that's a name I've not heard in a long time. This simple concept leaped off the page and answered the question I had in my mind about other religions. You know the question, why is Christianity the only true religion, and how does it show us the only way to God? Why do Islam and Hinduism not give us an adequate entry point to God? Well, in short, this is why. (laughs) Because you must have faith, and specifically faith in Jesus. This understanding of the gospel, however, isn't why the idea of justification by faith alone is controversial in some Christian circles, like with Catholics, because to them, justification by faith alone isn't in the Bible either. To them, the Protestants made up this doctrine 500 years ago, 1,500 years after the birth of Christianity. Seriously. Just listen to this guy. And today I'll be examining the historical evidence, or lack thereof, for what is probably the central doctrine of Protestantism. John Calvin wrote the following in a 1539 letter to Cardinal Sadoletto. All we have attempted has been to renew the ancient form of the church. If this is true, then we'd expect one popular doctrine among Protestants to be found among the church fathers, or really any prominent Christian before the Reformation in the 16th century. So what does the Bible teach and why is this even an issue? It's an issue because the word justification, like any other word, has a range of meaning, and it appears to be used differently in different places in the Bible, most notably in the seeming contradiction between Paul and James, which I'd imagine you're already aware of. In fact, this may surprise you, so I'd like to get it out of the way, but I see a difference in the way these ancient Christians used words like faith, justification, law, spirit, and flesh just to name a few. From the way we typically define them and understand those terms in a modern Western culture, many today don't realize the influence the Bible has had on the way we look at the world, but they also don't realize the influence Plato and Aristotle have had on us either. And in my opinion, we often approach the Bible from these aspects of Platonic philosophy and Aristotelian scientism. These were not a part of Paul's frame of mind in Romans or of James in his epistle or of the Apostolic Fathers, in my opinion. So getting at Paul's worldview, definition of terms, and word usage is key. I hope that makes sense. Now look at what James actually says about justification in relation to Abraham. This was literally the same person Paul uses in an example to say that we are justified by faith. James says, you see that a person is justified by what they do and not by faith alone. So what on earth is going on here, and how could this not contradict Paul, who said in Romans 4 that Abraham was justified by faith, the implication being by faith alone, before he was even circumcised? Well, the most common solution to this problem is that Paul and James are using the word justify in different senses. Again, I don't want to have a full-blown Bible study on the James-Paul issue. I just want to point out that many people believe this resolves the problem of the seeming contradiction. So if that's true, if it's true that Paul was talking in places like Romans 4 about a received righteousness that takes place once for all when a person first believes and that This, Catholics, hang with me for a sec. Declaration, crediting, or legal status is the means by which good works are produced. Then it is impossible for those same good works, whether they existed in the form of Old Covenant symbols or God's eternal moral code, to produce our justification. Still following me? 
again, if this is true, then what did James mean when he said works justify? Well, let's stick with Paul for a second longer because I think justification by faith alone, faith being an inward spiritual act of the circumcised, reborn human heart, this inward spiritual act alone justifies, righteousizes, and redeems the elect, bringing them permanently into covenant with God before they can produce good works. This is an important point to take from Paul's understanding of the Old Testament. And this is an important thing to keep in mind. These were not Paul's ideas, but scriptural principles God gave him unique insight into. Here's why I think that. In Romans 4, Paul said, is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before, and he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. This is a great passage that demonstrates many of the topics that usually go along with the issue. First, we can see the legal declaration of this justification. It's a, quote, crediting, not by works, Not by an infusion or a being made righteous, but a justification by proxy, a justification by naming, calling, saying the sinner is righteous. Now, some have said at this point, namely the New Perspective folks, that Paul is just talking about the Jewish ceremonial laws and entrance into the Jewish covenant. If this were true, it might open the door to reconcile James to Paul by saying that Paul also believes sinners are justified by works, just not circumcision or animal sacrifices or feast days. Yeah, that's if Paul was only talking about Jewish ceremonial law, capital L, but he wasn't. And that fact is made clearer when you consider Paul's fuller picture just within Romans. Again, I can see where some of the confusion can come in. Paul, for example, says in Romans 4.4, 4, now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Well, what does Paul mean by works? Is he just talking about Jewish ceremonial symbols, or is he talking about any good deed by which a person can seek to find themselves justified? I mean, at first glance, option one might make more sense of James. You know, this method of resolving the James-Paul conflict goes like this. Paul was only saying that we're not justified by Jewish symbols, and James doesn't contradict this, but sees an ongoing justification in a believer's life through good deeds. However, this understanding falls apart when you also consider that Paul also defined the law in a far more robust sense before his Abraham analogy, to the point that he says that even Gentiles have a law of sorts. Check it out in Romans 2.14. And clarifies how they sin i.e. through sexual immorality, idolatry, murder, things that have nothing to do with Jewish symbols per se. So what kind of law are we justified apart from when we have faith? (laughs) Any law, any kind of good deed, human work, or unfaithful outward activity by which a person might try to earn God's favor apart from him. In short, we just can't. That's Paul's explanation of justification. And before you have any inclination to go down any other path, Paul clarifies later in Romans 10 that if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And this is the key verse. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that that you profess your faith and are saved. Here we clearly and definitively see that Paul sees faith as an act of the heart before outward action surfaces, and that justification happens even before one speaks. This is the Protestant view. Justification 
before confession, justification before baptism, before alms or sacrifice, or anything that could be considered a person's work. I promise all of this will relate to the Father's view of justification in just a sec, but before we go there, let's reconsider James in light of Paul's precision. When James speaks of faith in the Greek pistis, the same word Paul uses, he means simple intellectual, easy believism kind of faith, the kind of faith that even demons have. It's not a saving faith. It's not an act of the heart. It's faith in a different sense. Likewise, when James is talking about saving faith, he's really talking about faith-filled obedience. He's talking about faith in a more robust sense. He's talking about the outward actions that inward faith produces. So, In a sense, he has a point. I mean, how else do we know faith is present other than by what someone does or says outwardly? If you say to someone, I have faith, and I mean by that, act on your faith, I'm using the word faith correctly in one sense. And I think that's the sense in which James, Paul, and the Apostolic Fathers sometimes use the word faith. It's a part for the whole kind of thing. Again, in a sense, someone is justified by works, if by that we mean they, by their true faith, are vindicated, authenticated, revealed to already be declared just. In addition to that, did you notice how in Romans 10, Paul breaks apart the idea of being justified and saved? Are these actually different activities? I don't think so. And in a modern context, those words are interchangeable for us when talking about our, quote, salvation. That's what we call it. I got saved. What I mean is I'm justified. Do you see the complexity of what I'm saying here? Often the ancients were okay swapping out terms and images where we're not as comfortable or vice versa. But for them, there was no contradiction. And as crazy as it sounds, I really don't think Paul and James would have seen the same contradiction with one another that we see in them today. Okay, so now let's discuss the fathers. How did they define justification, faith, and salvation? I think the best place to start is in this section of 1 Clement, who I already mentioned was a disciple of the Protestant Paul. And don't be mad at me for saying that. All I'm saying is that Paul, more than any New Testament author, teases out the broader conceptual context, a justification by faith exclusively as an inward spiritual activity before any outward works can be produced, before a person even speaks. Yes, He's that precise. Nonetheless, let's take this understanding to Clement. And while I'm reading, notice how Clement literally says we are justified by works. And think about how he defines good deeds as basic moral laws and not only the Jewish types and shadows. Seeing then that we are the portion of the Holy One, let us do all the things that pertain to holiness, forsaking slander, disgusting and impure embraces, drunkenness and rioting, and detestable lusts, abominable idolatry, detestable pride. For God, it says, resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Let us therefore join with those to whom grace is given by God. Let us clothe ourselves in concord, being humble and self-controlled, keeping ourselves far from all backbiting and slander, being justified by works. That's bad works as defined above. And not by words. For it says, the one who speaks, much shall hear in reply. Or does the talkative person think that he is righteous? Bless is the one born of a woman who has a short life. Do not be overly talkative. Let our praise, that vindication we receive when others notice our righteousness, be with God and not from ourselves. For God hates those who praise themselves. Let the testimony to our good deeds, again, bad deeds defined above, be given by others as it was given to our fathers who were righteous. Boldness and arrogance and audacity are for those who are cursed by God, but graciousness and humility and gentleness are with those who are blessed by God. There's a reason I'm pointing this out. Remember how we said that those in the New Perspective camp say justification, as Paul discusses it in Romans, is mainly an issue of the Jewish shadows? 
you know, the law in that sense. Yet I don't get the sense in Paul or elsewhere that he's breaking down the Jewish law like that. And I think this confirms it. Look again as Paul's disciple defines good deeds works through a moral lens with words like drunkenness, slander, lust, adultery, and pride. Okay, but what does he mean by justification here? Doesn't this contradict Paul? Not really. Again, they were comfortable using the same word in different ways. How does Clement mean we are justified? He means it in the sense of vindication or revelation of true inward faith. This was the same way in which James used justification, remember? Take a look again at verse 7 where he says, Let the testimony of our good deeds be given by others. Do you see where he's going? He's using the word justified in the sense of vindicating, validating, authenticating, confirming, or publicly legitimizing. And I don't think I'm making all of this up because translators have noticed this in both the Bible and in this verse from Barnabas. Therefore, when he gave the commandment, what did he say? Who is the one who condemns me? Let him oppose me. Or who is the one who vindicates, and that's justifies in the Greek, himself against me? All I'm saying is that the language and concepts are complex, and a lot of people don't realize that modern English actually has more words, yes, more words than any language in the history of the world. That includes ancient Koine Greek. In other words, we have the ability to be more precise than they did. I know Catholics like to look at this verse and verses like it and say, see, there is additional justification that is needed for the believer. I mean, in a sense, but in a completely different sense, a sense that is comprehensively different than the justification we receive before we even speak by an act of the heart, as Paul explains it. Taking this linguistic issue a little further, look as Clement continues and seemingly contradicts himself by saying that Abraham was justified only by faith. Remember, justified and made righteous are the same word in the Greek. Let us therefore cling to his blessing and let us investigate what are the pathways of blessing. Let us study the records of the things that have happened from the beginning. Why was our father Abraham blessed? Was it not because he attained righteousness, justification, and truth through faith with confidence? Isaac, knowing the future, went willingly to be sacrificed. With humility, Jacob departed from his land because of his brother and went to Laban and served him, and the scepter of the 12 tribes was given to him. Notice how Clement uses the word faith here like James does, in a sense of faith-filled obedience. It's like in his mind, faith is equivocated with these other internal activities, confidence, humility, and with various actions. He went, departed, served. That's a more dynamic understanding of faith than our Western precision normally allows for. But stop and think about it for a minute. Isn't that the point of faith? Trust, faithful obedience, faithfulness. Paul talked about this kind of faithful obedience in the opening to his letter to the Romans when he said that through Jesus, he had, quote, received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes through faith. Yet Paul also clearly distinguishes spiritual faith of the heart in Romans 10.10. Here's what I'm getting at. The point and blessing of a faith that justifies is a lifestyle of obedience, a lifestyle that glorifies God. It's just that the ancients sometimes use a part for the whole type of language. Sometimes when they say faith, they're actually talking about a person's faith-produced actions. And none of this takes away from a justification by faith alone. It's just that they used terminology differently than we do today, in a way that's a little less precise. All of this brings me back to another biblical slogan of the Reformers. We are justified by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. And so, as it pertains to justification, could this be what we're actually 
teasing out of the text here? Could it be that we are justified once for all by faith that is an inward act of the heart caused by spiritual regeneration before we even speak, and then our status of sonship is justified by works, you know, authenticated, realized, validated, recognized by what we do? Well, I think so. And take a look again as Clement continues. Anyone who sincerely considers these matters one by one will understand the magnificence of the gifts that are given by God. For from Jacob come all the priests and Levites who minister in the altar of God. From him comes the Lord Jesus according to the flesh. From him come the kings and the rulers and the governors of the line of Judah. And his other tribes are held in no small honor, seeing that God promised that your seed shall be as the stars of the heaven. All, therefore, were glorified and magnified, not through themselves, of their own works or the righteous actions they did, but through his will. Again, notice Clement's point that we are not declaratively, in a legal sense, justified by works. And so we, having been called through his will in Christ Jesus, are not justified through ourselves or through our own wisdom or understanding or piety or works we have done in holiness of heart, but through faith by which the Almighty God has justified all who have existed from the beginning. Just to add to a previous point that I had made about conceptual language, notice how he uses the words glorified and magnified as synonyms for justified. Again, this is a good reason that we shouldn't always get hung up on exact word studies. In fact, today, Christians sometimes use the word justification when talking about sanctification and glorification, or in this case, vice versa. Also, notice his use of the phrase righteous action, which conceptually could be swapped out with the word faith, albeit in a broader sense, and in the sense that it shows what inward spiritual faith does. It produces justified or righteous works. In other words, the works themselves don't make righteous, but they are born from righteousness. But more to my previous point, note how Clement says we are not justified by good works of any kind, including spiritual works of the heart that are not the product of faith. In other words, notice how he's pushing inward spiritual activity of faith here. Just look at what he compares to the faith that justifies wisdom, understanding, piety, things that are internal, but are reflected outwardly in our actions. Now, taking a step back, do you remember how he previously defined works, not Jewish symbols, but any moral good deed? The bottom line is he specifies that we are justified by faith, and I'll add alone because he doesn't qualify it in any way. He just says faith. That's it. Whether it's the justification we receive at rebirth or the succeeding outward vindication we regularly receive is not relevant for the point I'm making here because the statement is true. Just like popular Catholic apologist Trent Horn notes about how this passage clearly seems to articulate the historical, biblical, Protestant view of justification by faith alone. The primary source that these different authors rely on to try to show that sola fide existed in some form in the first century tends to be the letter of Clement, first Clement in particular. And the letter says this in part, and we too being called by his will in Christ Jesus are not justified by ourselves, nor by our own wisdom or understanding or godliness or works which we have wrought in holiness of heart, but by that faith through which from the beginning almighty God has justified all men, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, this sounds very Protestant. Sounds very Protestant. Very Protestant. And as Clement finishes up, he only seems to confirm this view of the relationship between justification, faith, and works with the following statement. What then shall we do, brothers? Shall we idly abstain from doing good and forsake love? May the master never allow this to happen, at least to us. But let us hasten with earnestness and zeal to accomplish every good work, the good worker receives the bread of his labor confidently. The one who is lazy and careless dares not look his employer in the face. 
It is therefore necessary that we should be zealous to do good, for all things come from him. For he forewarns us, behold, the Lord comes and his reward is with him to pay each one according to his work. He exhorts us, therefore, who believe in him with a whole heart, not to be idle or careless about any good work. This is what's obvious in Clement here, that he is speaking of faith alone as a spiritual act of the heart is evident in his question, shall we idly abstain from doing good and forsake love? It's the same question Paul begins with in Romans 6. It's the natural question people would ask if Clement and Paul were advocating a justification by faith alone, faith as in an inward spiritual act. What then is the importance of good works, of an outward faith, of love? Do you see what I'm saying? If Clement and Paul were articulating a reoccurring justification throughout the life of a believer, that's Catholic soteriology, this question makes zero sense. Again, Clement is not talking about Jewish symbols. He says, should we forsake love? And As those who have been justified by faith alone, clearly the answer is no. It's like he's saying, because you've been justified by faith alone, faith as an inward spiritual act, not easy believism, but true biblical trust and faith, you should earnestly also seek to do good works. Now that sounds a lot more like Paul in all of his letters. Then he even reverses the same worker wage illustration Paul uses in Romans 4 when he poses working for an employer as the opposite of faith. Here, Clement points out that those who have faith should still work and all the more for our heavenly employer, specifically because we've been justified by faith alone. And just to drive this point home, look at what Clement says in a couple of verses that I skipped over. For the Creator and master of the universe, I just conjured up images of (laughs) He-Man, himself rejoices in his works. For by his infinitely great might, he established the heavens, and in his incomprehensible wisdom, he set them in order. For thus spoke God, let us make humankind in our image and likeness. And God created humankind, male and female, he created them. So having furnished all these things, he praised them and blessed them and said, increase and multiply. We have seen that all the righteous have been adorned with good works. That is the key, adorned with good works. Indeed, the Lord himself, having adorned himself with good works, rejoiced. So since we have this pattern, let us unhesitatingly conform ourselves to his will. Let us with all our strength do the work of righteousness, do the work of justification. Do you see what he's doing here? He's saying that all the righteous, all those who are justified, already seen, declared, or recognized as righteous, however you want to say that, the point is that they are already righteous. These righteous ones have been adorned with good works. In other words, this is the relationship between faith and works. This is the Protestant view. Our good works are the fruit, the decorative proof of the justification we already had by an inward spiritual act before we produced them. Our good works are like the ornaments on the Christmas tree of our faith. You can quote me on that one. So, Long story short, I hope this was a helpful entry point to the issue of justification by faith alone in the Apostolic Fathers and the Bible for that matter. It sums up the linguistic and conceptual issues we face as a modern audience. Not comprehensive, and I plan to cover more of the Fathers in future videos. Hopefully, I showed you that not only is there no reason for concern as a Protestant, but hopefully you can also confidently, with faith, say along with me that patristics are Protestant. Also, don't worry, I've got lots more videos on this topic in the pipeline, so if you haven't done so already, help me out by liking, sharing, subscribing, so others can see this content. You can also view this video. It's a great introduction to this series on the Apostolic Fathers, and 
That's all I have for now, friends. I will see you in the next video. And in the meantime, it was great to gospel with you. We'll be right back.